Check. Check David Lee Scales. Sounds sounds like you uh, got the right mic and everything on the first go. Can you believe it? It's a new day. It's only been a hundred episodes. <laughs> hundred. I think we're on like three hundred and seventy. Hundred is... since using this microphone. Oh, great. Okay. Um. So we're not on three seventy. I think we're on two sixty, maybe. Nice. Do you want to guess the date of our first recording? I'm gonna go uh, summer of 20 2016 17 oh close. i mean maybe we probably recorded actually we did one or two with derek like, yeah where i interviewed you for surf splendor though yeah so that, that could cool. have been 2016 yeah great well here we are almost a decade on david lee scales coming up on our seven year anniversary yep no finer have we ever been man i actually look forward to it it's uh you know i don't get together weekly with a friend for coffee or anything like that or get a drink or something you know this is what that is basically it, it is it's sitting down with a friend surf talking about the week and or surf. sometimes not surf talking sometimes just talking about fatherhood about boys coming into the world that we you and i helped make feels good that's true, that's true. do you have a boy that I'm uh, aware of? I, I don't, but oh, okay. Kelly Slater sure is going to have one. All thanks. I mean, I'm not going to say all thanks to us. I'm going to say his spite son is 90% thanks to us, David Lee Scales. I thought he was having a girl. You didn't hear the news? No. What's the news? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Late breaking. It is the grid for March 29th, 2024. What is the breaking news today? Well, here's the thing. Okay. So this goes back to, uh, to us, me mostly, I suppose here saying Kelly Slater, world's greatest surfer, 11 time champion was never going to win another heat in his life. Which uh, our listeners reminded us of that you had said that because I would not have remembered it. And I didn't just say it. I said it and I said it and I said it and I said it and I wrote about it and I, vlogged about it and i said it again kelly slater no heat wins uh but what i was doing knowing that our goat uh he needed a little motivation right kelly wasn't going to win a heat by himself there was nothing there he so loves what, adversity he loves adversity and he needed spite he needed to spite me uh in order to win right just and like so, just like andy irons back in the day precisely kelly needed spite I planted the seeds of spite and it grew a beautiful spite tree that flowered there on the rocks or sand, I suppose, of Bell's Beach and Kelly Slater won a heat. But the other thing with this was I knew this was going to hurt Kelly's feelings, right? I knew that yammering on and on and on about him being old, him being past his prime, him not having it anymore, him not able to win another heat it was going to hurt a little bit. And so I was going to give him a gift too. I knew Kelly wanted to be like Josh. I'm sorry. He didn't want to be like Josh Kerr. He wanted to be like his great friend, Shane Dorian and have a son, right? He's got a daughter. He wanted a son. And so in order to give him a son, I also spitefully said he was going to have a girl just knowing that the spite goes so deep that that little spite baby would flip and become a son. And lo and behold, it did. Kelly is having a son. Um, you work in very complex ways. Almost, it's, hard. It's, it's a dark magic. It is. It's difficult, but Kelly has exactly what he wants now. And I felt it was the least I could do for all the years of laughs, for all the I like turtles, for all of the joy we've gotten out of Kelly. The least I could do was give him one more heat win and a son. Incredible work. If this is all that your legacy is, it this is what you are known for. It was all worthwhile. It'll be enough. It You've will taken be enough. a lot of barbs. It was yep. all worthwhile. Enough for this right here. Speaking of turtles, <laughs> uh, Kalani's belly almost mimics the shape of a turtle hump. It's so true. It is completely true. That uh, was his ultimate mission. I mean, imagine this. the Finally, the union between man and turtle that Kelly envisioned, I feel, 
that now gets to make a reality. I mean, Turtle Sandal Moon Sandals only goes so far to making this a reality. Having a little baby turtle is what brings it full circle. A little baby turtle boy. Yep. Pretty incredible. Think, spite turtle. If a spite turtle. If Kelly named his son Turtle, how absolutely epic would that be? Turtle Slater? I feel like, you know, you watch a great film and there's a final scene where everything snaps into focus and it's like this intricate web throughout the 159 minutes or one hour and 59 minutes. And then in that final minute, when you figure out who Kaiser Sose is, boom, it's pure poetry. You look back at everything and you go, wow, that was incredibly crafted. I was in I, they looped me in and then I got the reveal pig payoff. That's what Kelly Slater's life is. He has been a poet at work and we're all kind of making fun. Like, Oh, this seems like a bad mm. idea or just doesn't make sense to us at the time. Later, we are going to figure out that it was all a beautiful design by a beautiful mind. We are going to be sitting in the office, drinking our coffee, looking, thinking that we finally made fun of Kelly Slater for the final time. We really got that one last jab in. Sipping our coffee, coffee, looking at the bulletin board, and it's all going to come together. We're going to drop that cup, goosh, shatter in slow motion, boom. Walk out. Kelly's walking out with his, quote, limp from yep. his broken hip. Yep. And then we realize it was all a ruse. He By the has. way, one of the one of my favorite comments that I saw on, um, I don't know where it was. It might have been on our YouTube video. Somebody was like, clearly... If he's making babies, his hip can't be hurt that bad. It's real true, Kelly Slater. Making babies, making big old turns at Snapper. But then also, or Kira or wherever it was. But then also, look at him. Should we talk about his heat win? Well, I don't know. Is it worth talking about? Everybody, mm-hmm. the internet blew up uh, as if he won his 12th world title. A heat he won win. one heat in the opening round at Bells. But he beat his other son in air quotes, John, John sure. Florence, uh, yeah. in that heat. And then as Kelly does, Kelly Slater has become, he's a master of many things. One thing he's the master of, as everybody knows, is a total wet rag, uh, retirement announcement. Like after his heat win, that was part of his thing was to vaguely allude to, uh, you know, I probably not gonna, what did you read it? His statement? Yeah. Yeah, basically yeah, the, said, this is probably the last Bells event that I'll do. Yeah, this is probably the last Bells event I'll do. If I win here, like, it's funny, though, because Kelly, uh, you would think, like, and I'm sure that he is, like, cuckoo in his own Kelly way, um, but he's got a real good grasp on, uh, I don't, like, his actual chances of surfing, which I think is funny, right? Where he's like, you know, I don't know, like, yeah, so, okay, cool. I want to heat. Uh, I guess if I win this event, then I might that might be enough to get me over the cut line. Right. Uh, but that's probably not going to happen unless I do really good. I think he said at Margaret, I'm going to be cut. And so it seemed like Kelly was content to let his magic Kelly wild card uh, go. And yeah. if he gets cut at uh, Margaret, seemed like from what he said that that's it. He's off until, but of course he's going to go wild card Fiji. But why is he wanting? He's definitely not going to Brazil anyway. I mean, let's look. I was looking the other day at the events left on tour, as I am magically still in the Survival League, thanks to judges' naughtiness, re Ethan Ewing. But uh, I think the judges are also in Survival League, and they picked they, Ethan Ewing. I mean, my goodness, I well, we can get back to that. But uh, I. Yeah, anyway, I was looking down the rest of the pipe. Kelly is not going to go to, I mean, he'll go to Margaret, but he will not go to Brazil. We already know that. Yeah. Uh, He will go to Fiji and Chopu, but, you know, like, I would imagine that's it for Kelly, right? I would imagine. Yeah. Until next year when he also goes to the events he wants to go to. That's the thing, that wet rag announcement retirement thing. I think the reality there is, his retirement will not be an official retirement. It will not be Stephanie Gilmore or Carissa Moore saying, I just need time. Yeah, I need I need yeah. like a full life shift. I need a change of everything. It's him, you know, showing up for events that he has a chance at winning when the waves are good. So he'll still yeah. be around. 
So that's well, that's I think what that's related to. And that's will never not be around. How how much exactly. of uh, how much of Bell's speaking of did you watch? Dude, so little. Did like, you watch opening day when it was pumping? I had it on and I glanced at it. The thing is about pumping bells. Thing is, David Lee Scales, I'm no torquey expert, but uh, it's not a pretty wave. I'm gonna like it. Looks fun for me to surf. I think. Oh, oh yeah, look, it's got to be super fun. Yeah, look at how chunky this thing is. But watching these guys really struggle to find a place on the wave, yeah. and it was pumping that first day. It was like the dying backside of a of a major swell, but still really good waves. And them doing all kinds of mid face cutbacks in order to try to get somewhere else on the wave. Like it is not a high performance wave. Let's just oh, put no. it that way. Uh, and, and, and it's, it, it's not even like a good power wave. Like there's sections that are very powerful, but you have to time it perfectly. So I think that in the single fin era, it was a great wave to have on tour in the eighties era, even when boards had a lot of volume, 80 thrusters, eighties thrusters, that was still a good wave to have on tour. But in this modern era, it just, it is not the right canvas for the best surfers in the world to do their best surfing. Doesn't work. And I, you know, I, with bells, I will say, I totally appreciate that it's on tour. I am not advocating for bells removal bells being the longest running surf contest in the world uh, means something. And so it should be forevermore on tour, but everybody should just recognize this wave is, I mean, stinking, I don't know, horses for courses as our good friend stinking Devin Howard says, what if the surfers mixed it up a little bit at Bells and said, okay, what is actually going to make this wave look good? Because it's sure as heck ain't a pointy through. Like watching these guys hitch, hitch, hitch to try to like that bottom turn hitch where you got to do like four to get enough juice to kind of shoot somewhere onto the face, but not to like hit the lip with some magic bit of sorcery, like to do some, uh, to try to grind around a mid face cutback. Like, really trying to throw spray from mid face over the back of the lip. It looks like what they're trying, which is, it ain't pretty. It's um, even the best surfers having kind of their best rides. 50% of the ride is them struggling Yeah, to get into the correct position on the wave or into the lip or whatever it is. So yeah, it's not exciting. I will take the opposite stance of you and advocate for get rid getting rid of bells. I like years, that. It, though. What do you do yeah. with 50 years? Look, times have changed. It's great. <laughs> they had a great run. I think it served a purpose for a very long time, but I just want to watch the best surfers and the best waves. And this just simply isn't one of them. You know, But it I mean? would be interesting, I'm going to say, if you said, hey, look at here's the wave. We know what it is now. It's not like Bell is going to surprise us. Uh, choose if you want to ride your, you know, newfangled thrusters out there or hop on a CI mid or something, see what you can do. Uh, like it would be fun to see these guys for one event, make bells a ret. Cause it is a retro wave, make it a retro event. Like where you guys are the best surfers in the world. And of course we know you're the best on high performance shortboards. Who amongst you though, has got some panache on a, an eighties thruster or a yeah single fin or something. Choose, I, choose a different board. Look, they do the burly like singles fin contest i love the idea of a specialty event like that they could expand beyond burley and go to bells and do a, an event there but i don't need to watch gabriel medina you know trying to figure that out like aren't you gabriel aren't, medina is designed for other things and let's watch him do what he's great at but aren't you by curious about <laughs> david i mean about gabriel medina on a bit of retro craft it would be interesting to watch it's just uh, what i'm saying is the ct tour should be high performance, the best surfers in the world doing the best surfing on the best waves. You know what it's I mean? And so what you're F1, talking about, you're telling me, you're telling me it's the F1 of surfing and you don't want clearly. to see F1 drivers in Baja bugs. Yeah, exactly. That is interesting. And that would be a different thing, but we don't need it for the CT tour. We don't need to waste their time, you know, and the resources of the WSL. So that's my point. But you know what bells um, I'm surprised we even discussed it this much because it didn't have that much interest to me from what's transpired in the event so far. Ethan so. Ewing, Ethan Ewing, well, I mean, besides Kelly's spite win, uh, and you're welcome, Kelly. Like, I know I'm not going to get the credit uh, and I don't need it. That's not why I do this. I don't do this for credit. <laughs> so Kelly, you are, but you are very welcome. And when you look into the face of baby turtle uh, and know that little fella, that little guy 
was going to be a girl until I planted spite seeds. So you're welcome for that too. But uh, Ethan Ewing really uh, should not have won. I watched that whole thing. It's funny, like, and I'm going to criticize the judges here. Judges, it's difficult. It is a difficult, difficult, difficult thing, right? And I will say they get it right, obviously, more than they get it wrong, all this kind of thing. Uh, but anytime you see a surfer come in from a heat dejected, uh, you know he lost. He knows he lost. Everyone knows he lost. And so when the, the number reflects a win, it's just weird. Yeah, that was weird. I watched that heat as well. That was one of the heats that I watched in its entirety and totally did not think that Ethan got the win. When I watched his final wave surf, knowing the score that he needed, I was like, bummer, Absolutely Ethan's not. out. And Which, George Pitar was ripping too. That's George Pitar thing. was ripping. And I think for that heat, the argument could be made that uh, Ethan outsurfed George across the heat. Uh, but that one wave was not the score. And again, I'll keep yammering on about it now that Kelly has his heat win uh, and I can yammer on about something else. But these rules of professional surfing, God handing it down to Moses on the top of Mount Sinai along with the Ten Commandments. You're going to judge a heat in totality anyway. Just hold the scores until the end. Do it like boxing. Exactly. Have like what you think, you know, have the whatever surf journalists out there you know, putting their scores in. And at the end of the boxing heat, you say who won, right? Because then you could look at the totality of the heat and say this, now that we have all the information we need for this heat, we know exactly what to do. Why score them yeah. wave by wave? It's nonsense. It is nonsense. And I think that was kind of the argument. And that's what, what kind of transpired was George Pitar probably got overscored on yes. an earlier ride. And so when you look back, Back in its totality, you could say, "Oh, Ethan won," but it was so negligible. You know what I mean? It was like yeah. you could you could argue it either way. Sure, um, but we're grateful that Ethan won. Keep you in survival league. Did you? Exactly. Are you in the survival league second chance league? I'm in the losers league, is what it's called. Did, did you uh, pick Ethan Ewing as your first horse in the losers league? I did. Yeah. Yeah. I so I was too. like, if I lose round. I mean, event one in the Losers League, I need to just keep my 20 bucks next year. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, a lot of, if Ethan Ewing would have gone down, it would have absolutely, it, Survival League would have been over for this year. It would have been over at Bells. I mean, I think what, in the non-Losers League, 57% or something uh, picked Ethan, including me. Yeah. It's funny, when I was going through the list, thinking, uh, who am I going to pick? Who am I going to pick this time? I picked Ethan totally forgetting that he won bells last year. If I would have known that I would not have picked him. I think that is a real, you do not pick last year's winner in survival league. That's uh, why people did pick him. I know that's why they did. And then when I saw, I thought I was picking like a dark horse for some unknown reason. <laughs> I thought I was getting the guy who, who not a lot of people were going to pick. And I was like, Oh, I don't I have no so idea funny. what I was thinking, to be honest. Well, good. Keep up that strategy. It's working for you. Yep. Squarespace is the all-in-one website platform that is designed for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. Whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand, Squarespace makes it easy to create a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything from products to content to subscriptions. They have flexible templates with designs for every category, templates that are simple to drag and drop your artwork or logos into, but flexible enough to redesign to your specs. They have online store templates that make it easy to sell physical merchandise, digital or service products like podcast subscriptions and paywalled content. They even make customizable merch. You can design products and they will handle the production, inventory, and the shipping and handling. So let Squarespace handle it for you. They'll save you time, they'll save you money, and will save you money by going to squarespace.com slash surf. You get a free trial and you get 10% off your first purchase. Squarespace.com slash surf, enjoy. Um, you want some follow-up from last week? Sure do. We were talking about Tom Curran and potential neurological disorders. You might be surprised to know we got a lot of feedback on that. I can't believe it. <laughs> um, so I will not play their calls. I mean, they were all very cordial. Like people are incredibly um, filled with grace in yes. how our short, when it comes to our shortcomings on that topic specifically. And they were just kind of providing um, education insight. for, yeah, education and insight for what it's like to either live with a neurological disorder or live with someone who has. 
And so um, there was a couple of calls. I'll just sum them up for you rather than playing. Uh, number one was diagnosing people allows them to get access to treatment. Because you were saying, you know, there's no need to diagnose. Just say you're weird and whatever. We don't need yeah. a label on everything. Well, it turns out there's state-sponsored treatment for certain things. And um, if you're not in a financial position to pay for everything on your own, then it's absolutely imperative that you do get diagnosed so that you can get the help that you need. So diagnosis does serve a purpose. Somebody else said it's lame to armchair diagnose, and it's even lamer to claim that you have it autism spectrum disorder without being diagnosed by a neurologist. And I guess there's shows like love on the spectrum on Netflix, obviously. And I guess young Sheldon was about somebody, the kid, I guess had autism. Uh, I never watched that. It's unaware, but you know, because of the kind of popularity of shows like that, then people start self-identifying and then self-diagnosing and then claiming that they have something. And he was saying um, there, you know, that's, that's actually detrimental to those who actually have it clearly. And so get go see a neurologist. But the great thing about all of this is that open discussion does help to remove the stigma, creates more understanding, normalizes uh, it being something that simply people have or they don't have. You know what I mean? It's not like you're a bad person or that something is wrong with you. It's just some people have this thing, some people have that thing. And so open conversation is a good thing. I love, and again, thank you to our dear, dear listeners, not only for grace, but for providing insight. When I think when David Lee and I discuss these matters of which we are not even remotely near expert, knowing always that the truth will come out next show, all you have to do is hold on for one show and then actual insight and perspective and all of this comes out. I love that, that, yeah, that this happens here, right? That uh, like I am perpetually, my own horizons are perpetually broadened by this program. Completely. Yeah. And I, for the first couple of years of doing this show, I uh, was apprehensive to take the flack for that one week in order to get to the, the truth. But now at this point, like certainly with last week, I'm like, you know what, this is a conversation that people are having quietly, you know, behind closed doors or, you know, just off air basically. So why not just have it publicly? I could take the flack for a week. No big deal. Truth sure. will come out next week. We'll all be better for it. We'll all be more educated for it. So let's just try to have the conversation respectfully that nobody else is willing to have. 100%. So I'm cool with it. Um, we did get going from one somber topic to another. We did get another call that I would like to play for you. Um, David, Chaz, Jason calling again from the frozen tundra of Chicagoland. Uh, fun, exciting news. My wife and I just welcomed our first baby boy into our world. Poor guy landed in uh, the NICU uh, with pneumonia. We're almost through the storm with that. And was reflecting on a recent episode from you guys, thinking about how are you still a surfer? If you take some time away, probably won't be doing much surfing out here in Chicago with a sick little baby boy in the next uh, coming years. But as I was pondering that, I had a more, uh, perhaps more important reflection. Because at no point, looking at that little boy all wired up in the NICU, healing up, emotion and love just pouring out of mom and dad. But at no point did I want to kiss that baby on the mouth. Keep up. <laughs> I love it. Very, very funny. Speaking of Kaiser Sose, he really zigged at the last moment when I thought he was going to zag. It was a real good zig, though. Oh, man, nothing breaks my heart. And so hoping and praying for the boy to pull through, or obviously he's pulled through, but uh, to be okay. But man, that's heartbreaking. When you see... Uh, infants oh gosh yeah in the NICU like all wired up and my heart goes out to any and every parent who's ever had to deal with that it is yeah I mean I can't I literally can't imagine it and you folks are strong and god bless every one of you there's nothing more tragic in humanity than you know the senselessness of something happening to a young baby like that yeah um, when you see what's going on around the world too, just, yeah, you know, heartbreak. Yeah. And Haiti and 
obviously Gaza stuff when mm-hmm. babies just don't have yeah. access to whatever. Tragic, but hey, you got to appreciate a dad who can crack a joke like that. At the <laughs> end, I mean, it. it's really true though. At the end, what do we got, right? Like, that's it. In, I mean, it's humor at the end, which I don't know, like, yeah, graciousness and humor. Yeah. Well, but funny thing is too, he actually called back with a second call to say, Hey, I forgot to say, Kelly's definitely going to kiss that little baby boy of his on the mouth. <laughs> um, which, okay. We, this is a callback to six months ago. We had an ongoing conversation about whether it's okay, barrel or not to kiss a baby on the mouth, kiss yeah. your child, your baby, yeah, your child. <laughs> we didn't say baby. We said your yeah, child, child on the mouth. Yes. And then the conversation evolved into kind of what the age limits were. Yes. But I think that conversation was more about they will outgrow it. You know, like you can't kiss your 20 year old kid on the mouth. So what age do they outgrow it? This call reminded me that, in fact, a baby can be too young. Like, I agree with him. You don't want to kiss your infant on the mouth. That's weird. They're like a little alien at that point. But there becomes a point where they're big enough old enough to kiss on the mouth and then they outgrow the kiss on the mouth at a certain point. I'm still going with kissing the baby. Man, I, I am, the C's have got even flatter in my world on kissing babies on the mouth. Keep your mouth, you keep your filthy mouth away from that precious little portal. <laughs> um, There was something else I wanted to say about that call. I forget what it is now. Maybe it'll come to me later. Anyways, we got a surf shop in the wild last week. That spurred a few emails. Would you like to hear some surf surf shop nostalgia? Sure will. All right, cool. Hey, Chaz and David, I've got a surf shop in the wild experience to share with you that is a cultural time capsule of the area that I surfed during my formative years in the 90s in the towering shower shadows of Surfer's Paradise High Rises, a few buildings down from a strip joint nestled between a cinema and McDonald's and underneath a hardcore techno day club called the Biscuit Bar sat the Gold Coast's most northern core surf shop, Surf Savage. Surf Savage was an institution for the little crew of grommets that used to surf the southern banks of Surfer's Paradise at the time. Having the clothing, wetsuit, merchandise section in the front main room and a sunken back room with all the fresh boards lining the walls, it was a a cave that was a sanctuary in midst of the chaotic tourist mecca and seedy nightclub scene. We could stash our boards and backpacks in the shop while we snuck into the cinema's next door and watch movies in the afternoon when the wind was on shore and scrap or scratch together enough money to eat something at McDonald's post surf when the way when we were so hungry that we would almost faint. I had so many fond memories of hanging out in that shop, flipping through magazines and sticker folders. Remember those things while the shop owners would tell us about the relevance of surfers. I had no idea about like buttons, Kaluyo Kalani, the functionality of the emerging lost fish boards, playing the videos on repeat and the absurdity of surfing Mavericks being a literal polar opposite of the surfing experience. We shared in the turquoise warm water beach breaks that were a couple of blocks away from the shop. These days, my car uh, work, my work car park is next to a boat building factory. And each day when I open the door, I'm hit with the nostalgic smell of PU resin, bringing me right back to the feeling of walking down the stairs of that shop back room, being in awe of the racks of boards that, and feeling the vibration of the bass keeping, or the bass keeping the uh, zombie tweakers dancing on the top of the ceiling above. Hanging out in that shop in my early teens really was an education that money couldn't buy that I feel so fortunate to have grown up with and a feeling um, and I feel is missing a missing link for the kids growing into adolescence today. Having a space where a community exists without overbearing supervision is but is still safe just does not exist in these TikTok times. Keep work, Ian. Beautiful. Thank you, Ian. And so true. And I wonder, I, you know me, I, nostalgia, I fully believe is a disease, a mental disease and blah, 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 and times change. And there's something today that is a version of that. But again, I, I have no idea what, like I was watching yesterday, coming home late on the train from Los Angeles, uh, watched a documentary called Kill All Redneck Pricks. Carp. I've not seen this. 
which is, yeah, it's not that great, but it's just about a band from Olympia, Washington in the, you know, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. So it was like a nostalgic kind of thing, but they, they referenced the, you know, in the nineties, like grunge era band, whatever. Uh, but they were referencing, uh, how it was like peanuts back then, how there was no parents anywhere. It was just kids going to concerts, kids going here and there that like nobody had any recollection of parents, uh, which is, yeah, I mean, I, th I feel like with these, you know, surf shop days and all this, like you didn't have to hover as a parent because, and I, you know, I don't know, was, was life, was society actually safer back then was, you know, what is, what has changed? I can't imagine letting kids go, you know, Oh yeah, see you. Be home by dinner, kind of thing. I can't either. You know, I'm wondering if the overarching thing that's changed is there was more community back then, like face to face interaction in community. And now we're still living. We're probably living in denser um, environments, populated, more densely populated environments than we ever have before. But there's no need to face to face interact with anybody. And I think that that creates a real separation for when you do interact, people are almost your adversaries. They're competing yeah. for the same resources. You know what I mean? Like, as opposed to when everything was developing, you're all in it as a community and you benefit from helping one another out. And now the person is actually just driving up your mortgage or rent or whatever. So they're almost, it's adversarial. Yeah. Nasty times, but hopefully to the kids. Good thing we don't have any kid listeners, but find a way, find a way to have community. You know what? I mean, honestly, this community that is being, is replacing the surf shop that he's uh, talking about is kids playing Fortnite online. That's true. That is totally true. My or kid, us podcasting every yeah. Friday. I mean, my kid gets together with her buddies on, you know, Roblox or Fortnite or whatever she's playing. And it is, yeah, I was talking to a parent the other day who was like, had restricted, restricted, restricted any kind of video game playing, assuming that it was the video games of our youth where it's just a, you know, whatever, a waste of time you go play a video game and then realized, oh, wait, this is how this, my kid like visits their friends. They like go into this world and yeah, it's all birthed out of COVID and whatnot. And so to be the parents like, nope, it's like the parent who's like, yeah, you can't go see your friends. Sorry. You gotta, can't go to the park and play and socialize. No, got nothing. Yeah. It's very different though, because it, I mean, it's hard to say it's better or worse. It's hard to say that it's worse because yeah. that's what every older generation says about the younger yes. generation, but there is no physicality in this version of it. Yep. I bet. I wonder like when our children are 40, 50, whatever, looking back and saying, man, we, when we used to get together on Roblox and see each other, you know, uh, those are the, like there'll be Roblox nostalgia, I would imagine the, yeah. like we have nostalgia for surf shops. Well, maybe it won't be uh, a lasting thing. Could just be a phase too. There was a lot of phases that, you know, phased, phased out of our youth too, whether it was pogs or Ooh, I don't pogs. know what. Yeah. It was like, I don't know, a little, little video game kids. where you got to, yeah, garbage pail kids was a short lived thing, you know, yep. deservedly so. <laughs> Um, well, hey, we got a couple of submissions, believe it or not, for Kook and Curran. Wow, back. Old school. Bringing it back. It was never dead. It was just nope. waiting in the wings. The, re the reality is there. it needs to wait in the wings. It isn't a weekly. There aren't enough Kook and Currans. If, there, if it is weekly, it's being done wrong. Exactly. So for those of you who have not um, listened to those past shows, there are certain things in the surfing world that only kooks do and only currents do and nobody in between um you know a gopro on the nose of your surf for example wearing socks over your ears <laughs> <laughs> wearing a rash guard over your wetsuit you're either a kook at the surf school or you're on the CT winning heats or losing heats. Either way, you're still still occurring in that scenario. So we have a new submission from a listener, which was funny because I was on uh, Beach Grit the other day. I forget what the article was. And somebody left a comment in the comment section with this exact kook and current. And he even said like, hey, that's a real kook or current. And then stated what it is. And I was like, oh, cool. Deep, deep pull from this commenter. 
Then an email pops in in my inbox, who I presume is from the same commenter with a much more thorough explanation of why. Fantastic. Current. Yeah. So here's the email. Greetings, DLS and Chaz. I believe I have personally conflicted a kook and current for you to pass your judgment upon. I didn't begin surfing in earnest until I was around 16 years old. And as a late starter, I found myself actually... Uh, acutely aware of how I and others present in and out of the water due to my own self-consciousness at being behind in the learning curve compared to some of my peers who lived closer to the waves and had begun surfing at a, at a younger age, I became an often failing student at how not to be instantly identified as a kook, at least until I actually was taking off and blowing a wave. Equipment was almost always a dead giveaway out of date or ill-fitting wetsuits a moldy wax job was the most telling in or moldy wax job or the most telling an old and yellowed surfboard almost surely marked the user as a dying died in the wool beginner and a coup i came to use these telltales as a way to rate the lineup noting which surfers I would navigate around, back paddle, or on occasion straight up burn on a set wave. An old yellow board generally meant that no threat, there was no threat to wave status in lineup and rotation. And this system worked about 99% of the time. An outlier would catch me off guard occasionally and was such a disruption to the order of things that I began to take note. A faded Alita or perhaps hotline wetsuit stretched over a a little too tightly over a larger frame than it was designed to cover and the wearer paddling a visually hideous surfboard that uh, should probably float a little bit higher in the water or alternatively is sized far too big for said rider. A sun-toasted and mottled yellow piece of yard art. However, something about the attitude and posture and the paddle stroke and how the rider sharks the takeoff zone marks them as a wild card. A set wave comes through and they are somehow deeper than they should be. The lineup is jostling to pick up the change as soon as they are surely dispatched by the lip. Yet the wave caps, jumps, and runs off, and there's no sign of the expected yard sail popping up in the wash, and no one else has taken off for some reason. And then at the count of four, I look back and the top of the lip line is sent skyward, nebulizing out of the back over those of us who are still just lamenting the wasted wave and now bending next to try and make sense of the disappearing, dis of the dissonance between the appearance and the performance. It was a ripper in a perfect disguise. To my recollection, I have never clocked a decent, quote unquote, surfer in this identity. It's either a hazard cone in the lineup or this extremely rare, couldn't give two shits what I look like, uh, lineup cleaner, cleaning ripper or dropout style master. Here is my dilemma. As I, as in uh, incorrectable, sur incorrectable surfboard nerd, I spent far too much time and money hunting down. Incorrigible is probably what he meant. It's... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, it auto-corrected to incorrectable surfboard okay. nerd. Yeah, but incorrigible surfboard nerd. I spent far too much time and money hunting down the garbage discarded from past eras. And I absolutely love riding the best, worst, and weirdest boards that I can find. All of them beat up, hammered, and yellow. So am I self-aware, pretty good, okay surfer? Um I'm sorry. So as a self-aware, pretty good, okay surfer, this lands me 1 million watt miles away from current status, which would undeniably rank me squarely in the kook corner of any lineup. If there is no empirical middle ground here, I suppose I simply must accept my lifetime kook status or do away with this rating system entirely. So is it a kook or current riding beat up yellowed surfboards? Hey, work. I think our dear listener, and thank you so much for bringing this up, because how would we even know to think about these important things without emails like this, David Lee Scales? Would this thought have popped into your head naturally? You know, I invented kook and current, so there is the potential that I would have identified this one at some point down the road, but no, I had not identified it yet. And so, as such, though, I think he very much answered the question himself at the end. Kooker Curran is a thing either kooks 
or current current adjacent stew. Uh, in this case, you and I have all tried out an old board. Every surfer, I think, if you haven't, you got something wrong with you, right? If you don't have that board that you've kept for 20 years in your garage uh, and think, you know, every, I don't know, 12 years, you think, I'm going to try that thing again. That's weird, but I'm going to try it, right? So I think this is a, I think any surfer, any average surfer worth his or her salt has a completely, at least one completely yellowed board in the quiver. And that board gets ridden not often, not even sometimes, but gets ridden once every blue moon, thereby making this not a kook or curran. I think you, you're right. I mean, I was on the fence up until you started talking and I realized there's been phases where I, you know, I remember one board specifically 15 years ago that I got, it was like, um, 1984 Stuart thruster five foot seven, maybe five foot eight that I got at a garage sale for 20 bucks. And I just happened to be, I don't even know what, where the garage sale was, happened to see it, saw a surfboard there, walked up. I was like, how much is this thing? 20 bucks? No problem rode that thing a lot. Like yeah. it was so much fun. And I'm not, if I see a garage sale, what if I came across a McTavish or something like that? I don't have that's iconic that somebody doesn't know what it is guaranteed. I'm going to go surf that thing. Exactly. And so I think this, and this, it is certainly an outlier situation, but it is not like a freaky outlier, which that's what makes the kooks and currents. I mean, it, like not that it's a freaky outlier for the kook but yes there's and certainly you know when you see a kook on a yellowed board and a yellowed board 95 percent of the time signifies full-on kook but that five percent that's too big a margin of error i think uh for things to be a kook or current and that is the precise math by the way it's 95 percent kook one percent ripper and then that four percent is what we're really getting is to the, the is the guy who has, because once again, the problem herein, every, and I defy any caller who's been surfing more than, uh, we'll say more than 15 years. Uh, if you don't have a utterly yellowed board in your lineup or in your quiver, what are you, you're not, I will say you're not a surfer. I will say if you are either that or you're a neat freak, you like yeah. have to clean so fast and furious. And furthermore, I think we should normalize your yellow board, David Lee Scales. I think our dear listeners should send in pictures of their favorite yellowed board. Let's bring the yellow board back as like, you don't have to go surf it again, but why was that board so special? Why do you still have it? Because nobody has an accidental yellow board, I mean, or maybe you have a couple accidental yellowed ones in your garage or in your environment, but you for sure have those two yellowed boards are there for an absolute reason, but no, yeah. nobody's even seen them for years. Let's bring those back. Let's celebrate those yellow boards. I have a, my mom keeps a couple of my old surfboards from when I lived with her um, when I was a teenager that they're in her backyard now. So I go there and I see this one, Timmy Patterson. It's gotta be 5'10 swallowtail thruster. And I see it in the back, leaning up against the fence, kind of covered by some, Junk. Um, yeah, like no bushes that have yeah. kind of grown over it, like creepy crawly on the wall bushes. And I look at that board and I'm just like, if it was just sitting in the garage yellowing, it might still have some life in it. But the fact that it's been in the sun for 20 years yeah. now is just, it's dead. Like there's no chance I could ride it, but I have really good memories from riding that board. And a part of me wants to grab it and take it out. I think it'll probably fall apart under my feet before, I, or maybe duck diving it, it'll just fall apart. Like it's that brittled, but man, I've got great memories from that thing. We should all, we, again, we should all take pictures of our favorite yellowed and send in your stories. We should do yellow board tales, or we can think of a better name. <laughs> we can um, feature one yellowed board per episode. It's, you know what? And also, yeah, send a, send the story with them if there is a story or just, Tag me on Instagram in your story and I'll just repost it. Yeah. Why? Why splendid. is this board? Like, because again, how many boards have you like given away? Uh, not enough. That's a great way to get rid of old surfboards. And I, yeah, I I've mean, probably given away less than 10. 
Totally. We've talked about selling is a no-no because you're, it's just whatever. Like selling, unless you are a freak, a weird freak, like Ron from board porn, uh, selling, which I don't even know that he sells his boards to be honest. But uh, if you have a ton of boards, if you're coming into a ton, I could see, oh, selling, you know, yeah, whatever. But most of us, if you're going to get rid of one, you give it away. You yeah. give it, and we've discussed what was the beautiful charity taking them down to Mexico. Baja. Um, yeah, I forget. So, uh, Collectivo Surf is Noel's that's business what it was. name, yeah. yeah. Collectivo Surf. So, there's places like that that you can give, but if you have that yellow board that you have not given, there's definitely a reason why. What is that reason? What, yeah. why does that board stick around? Yeah, let us know. Let us know. Um, okay, well, oh, by the way, that story turns into a pros in the wild because he left a post script yes. and he said the example given was one such wave that i witnessed on the north side of huntington beach pier around 2001 the surfer a slightly overweight and unknown at the time to me as a clueless young surfer was bud lamas bud lamas riding an old yellowed robert august his pro model board absolutely yeah. ripping love amazing you, that's a good pro in the wild right there haven't thought about bud lamas in for a long time i know factormeals.com slash surf 50 let me tell you factor meals has filled a specific gap in our lives that has simplified our busy schedules and satisfied and nourished us if you follow me on social media, you know that I love to cook. My wife and I love food and wine, but there are still at least five meals a week where we're just underprepared, short on time, and don't want to make a bad dietary decision, nor sacrifice the pleasure that we get out of dining. Factor has solved it. Chef prepared meals that are delivered to your house weekly. They take two minutes to heat up and they're designed to be eaten anywhere. There's no prep, no cooking, and you can recycle the package that it comes in. Delicious meals that are good for you with over 35 options to choose from each week. Go to factormeals.com slash surf50. Less expensive than dining out, more delicious, more nutritious. Factormeals.com slash surf50. Okay, so... Official pros in the wild submission coming in from Florida. Uh, quote, the year is 2018. I'm with three families at our annual spring break trip to the shark attack capital of the world, New Smyrna Beach, Florida. I'm the only surfer in the group, preteens, teenagers, family dynamics. The surf had been firing all week, but my sessions were shorter than I had hoped. The last day, I escaped solo for four hours of uninterrupted fun at the inlet. Saw all the local pros showing why they are pros. Michael Dunphy grew up in the area, and despite me being 20 years older, he always said hello and acknowledged me. He is, is and always has been a class act. I had come in, surfed out bliss feeling. Spring break was over, started packing my boards for the flight home. I had just zipped the coffin and cracked a beer when I heard a lady screaming. Her son and husband were in a rip and it was bad. I looked up and I saw Dunphy sprinting in to help. I also sprinted to attempt to help the pro in the wild save a life. Fortunately, we got to the kid pretty easily, but the dad was absolutely freaking out. He was a big boy and he was in full panic mode. Dunphy's 25-ish liter surfboard was the only flotation. The dude was clutching in and fighting hard, not good. His fingers sinking into the single layer of four ounce glass on the deck of the surfboard. It was hard work to keep him afloat. And we were all in this zone called the shark pit. Fortunately, a wave hit us and pushed us into the area where we could, where we could uh, touch and stand and the life was saved. It was surreal. Mike mentioned that he was flying to Portugal the next day. We chatted for a few minutes, high on the adrenaline and the bizarreness of just went down. Went down. Uh, I snapped a picture of us. He included the picture. I'll post it on the website. And then P.S. Many congrats to Dunny for his second Ed and Barbados last weekend and winning the North American division and qualifying for the ch uh, CS, the Challenger Series. He's a true pro in the wild. Kick some ass at Snapper, Dunny. He's a true hero and a pro in the wild hectic very very fine submission and i love the michael dunphy is not only the pro in the wild michael dunphy is that rare creature surf creature 
growing rare by the day, I would imagine, who has somehow carved out an entire 20 year, maybe even 30 year at this point career. Michael Dunphy was surfing in events, was a known quantity. Back when I uh, first started working at Surfing Magazine, uh, this would have been, yeah, I don't even know, 15 years ago, where he was exactly what he is now. <laughs> where imagine like the QS grinder, right? Which we talk about, or I think it used to be more of a thing than it is now with, you know, sponsorships going away and blah, 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 blah. I think that's harder. But Michael Dunphy, because Michael Dunphy, let's just be honest, it's not like he's waiting his turn to finally get on the CT and blow up. No. If Michael Dunphy, accidentally won enough challenger series events to make it onto the CT, he would be bumped so far out by Margaret that it wouldn't even be funny. Uh, but Michael Dunphy has that perfect skill to like slay in pretty crappy, generally crappy places. Not that Barbados is crappy, but will win at Huntington every once in a while, or will win in New Smyrna, or will win here and there, you know, Virginia Wadi Beach. Yeah, exactly. And keep on, keep on pro surfing. Where I wonder at the end of the day, if Michael Dunvey is the patron saint of surfing, if this is the kind of guy who we should all look to, we, the Gabriel Medinas and the Idolos and the, I don't know, even Griffin Colapintos and Jack Robinsons, John John Florences go on and on. But these guys are all freaks of nature. They're not like you and me. They yeah. are freaks. And I like to, watch them do their freak thing. And that's great. But Michael Dunphy, he's us. He is a guy just trying to get by at his job. It's interesting. I mean, there were thousands of guys that kind of fit the same profile as Dunphy for a decade. Tens and of they thousands, all, I'd say. What? Tens of thousands, I would Poss say. Yeah, possibly. And he's one of the last vestiges of that era. You know, like to be able to still afford to be able to do it and still have mainstream sponsors. I mean, he's still on Quicksilver, right? I think so, so, yeah. So he's making money doing it. And um, it became financially unviable for everybody else. And somehow he's navigated away and he's still winning events or getting second place in events. And maybe on the come up still, like somehow is still uh, doing better each season. I had, I went on a surf trip with Dunphy one time, we went to Costa Rica. And I will tell you exactly to your, your kind of what you're talking about. He was not the most talented surfer on the trip, like naturally talented, but he was the hardest working surfer on the trip. He was, he surfed double the amount of time of anybody else and would not come in until he bagged the clip, you know, Dunphy here's to Dunphy. Totally. But, um, uh, like the Dunphy, uh, Oh, what was I going to say about old Dunphy? Well, while you're thinking about it, I've got one quick story about him. On that trip, he was uh, he had been to Costa Rica like five times in the last six months or something like that. And um, he would just do strike missions down there all the time. So he knew the roads better than anybody else. So he was the driver of the rental car. And he drove like an absolute madman. Like it was very scary. And I, I'm a pretty aggressive driver. And people get scared when they're in the car with me sometimes. I was very scared to be in the car with him, you know, like going full speed on dirt roads around blind turns, like in the passing people in sketchy spots. I survived the trip, thankfully, but on the very next trip that he went to Costa Rica, I, he posted an Instagram with his car rolled over in a ditch. Nice. That makes me, so, all of that makes me like Michael Dunphy even better. <laughs> that he's a crazy driver that he's a crazy driver that i wonder if michael dunphy sits down at the start of each year with the various contests he can enter and legit just treats it like a job like crunches okay what my winning like here's what the entrance fee is if i get into the round of xyz i will make this amount of money and if he just truly uses it as a you know sponsorship money that's going to continue to go down or i can't really control that what i can control is entering a ton of contests and knowing that if i get this place this place this place that i will be you know making 60 grand a year it's possible that'd be a smart way to do it um but as you were talking i'm thinking i am now rooting for him to get on the championship tour to prove you wrong 
Like just like you did with Kelly Slater. I want to see I could, a I want to see a, a spite, spite tree. A spite Dunphy. Like because I don't necessarily know that I had a vested interest to see him get on the CT before, but with you saying like, oh, he'll get on there and then he'll get bounced out before Margaret. So I'm like, will he? Like, I would love to see him level up in big um, surf doing big turns. Michael Dunphy, if Michael Dunphy, and here's the spite tree has to be serious. The spite seed has to, has to be pure spite. Michael Dunphy, you are a great crappy surfer. And you have no ability to make it on to the CT in any meaningful way. If you accidentally make the, make it there, you will stink and people will be mad when they have to watch your heats. They'll think, why is this stinking guy here? He smells bad. His surfing is odious to my nostrils. Get him gone. Michael Dunphy, take that. Put it in your heart. Wow. So Put it, it was in, in your heart. It was initially just a spite wheatgrass seed. And now I think you just planted an oak tree. Let's hope. We're going we're gonna to see him showing up at 20 foot cloud break next time they get a big swell. Let's hope. Wow. Okay. Well, shout out. Thank you, listener, for the pros in the wild. Um, what's your timeline looking like, Chaz? I got about 30 more. Okay, cool. Let's do a true grit or click bait switch. Quote, question. Why aren't there more Mormon professional tour surfers? Question mark. It's really a great question and something that I think I need our community. I put this on Beach Grit and we've got some feedback, not enough good feedback, but I think our community here on the Grit Podcast will help elucidate even more why. There's the so this whole thing came up. I was out to dinner. Uh and saw a large table filled with, a, you know, four adults and a lot of, like, late high school, early college uh, age kids. Uh, every one of them was sharp, clean looking. Uh, the boys all had razor, razor defined and uh, wetsuit neck tans. Everyone at the table was drinking Topo Chico. And I knew this table here is Mormon. Like it was undeniably Mormon from both every, it just was Mormon. And then I, again, I thought, what? They're clean living, they're healthy, fit, athletic, a lot of times money. Uh, how is there not, how is the tour not littered with, I get how not back in the Andy Irons day when sort of, I think partying was, you know, I don't know, something like that you had to kind of do to be around uh, or at least engage where these days when you got your Griffin Cola Pintos and everybody's all healthy and health vibes and healthy lifestyle and all this, how is there not a Mormon crusher out there just dominating? Man, it is a great question. I, if I were, um, if there was a stock to invest in that was Mormon related surfer. to Mormon surfers, yeah, I would absolutely buy that stock right but you'd now. You'd be losing your money. You'd be losing your money. There is no because not... I think you're identifying that in the next ten years it could become something. I mean, you'd think, but like, let us not forget though. This is not a new thing. Mormons have been doing clean living and stuff forever. Also, where is the campuses of BYU, David Lee Scales? Do you know where the campuses of BYU are? Waco, one Texas. Lake, one in Salt Lake City. Is there a campus in Waco? Oh, uh, maybe I'm thinking of a different. You're probably Mormon thinking of a college. Different. Yeah, but there we have BYU in Salt Lake City. Oh, what is that? We have BYU on Oahu's North Shore as well. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, we do. We've had that for a long time. The islands, various Pacific islands are littered with Mormons, right? I mean, they went on a tear, a missionary tear down there, and it seemed like it really took. And so you have, like, it's not just, oh, they're not pro surfers because they all live in landlocked Utah. Uh, no, they're all over the entire Pacific and loads of them in California. Like how, how healthy family first, how is Mormon dad not down there at 4am with little Mormon boy, like getting him into waves, like every part of Mormonism you think lines up directly with being a successful professional surfer circa 2024 yeah that is shocking you yeah you've stumbled upon something that is as perplexing as the french paradox that we discussed a week or two ago exactly and like if there was one 
CT. I mean, one like lower down guy. There is zero as far right. as I know, zero and hasn't been. Well, as far as you know, is it possible that, I mean, I don't think of Mormons as being the most um, outspoken about their religiosity. I, I think we'd know. I think we would know if there was a Mormon CT surfer and or had been in the last five, six years. Mm. Like okay. for sure, for sure we can count. Kolohe's not, Griffin's not. Like you can go through the ones who might be. And let's say, I don't think Mormonism penetrated Brazil as much as it did Tonga. And so we have- Or, or you know, Australia none, for that matter. Yeah, so none of the Brazilians are. The Australians aren't also. So you kind of know who- could be is the white Americans uh, and or, you know, maybe a, a, a Tahitian, though I don't think it went as far there as well. But in any case, we would know. And there has been not four, not three, but zero. Okay. Well, maybe the truth will come in next week as it often does, but I am so, curious to get to the bottom of this. It's a great question. It's a great question, but honestly, I think that you're just identifying something, a trend that will come within the next decade. So I would buy that stock. Oh, man, it should have come already. They've been clean living. Mormonism ain't nothing new. But the, geog the geography, I think, was limiting until recently. I mean, that it, North Shore campus was always there, but you don't get into surf. Like, if you get into surfing in college, you don't become a professional surfer. At any of course point. not. That's but, too late. But you would think, you would very well think that, I mean, there's a giant Mormon temple right here in San Diego. They're littered up and down. Orange County has like so many big fancy Mormon churches. And you would think that one of these Orange County, San Diego County, whatever, kids, dad's out there pushing them in the wave. Kids like, oh, time to go to college. Going to go to BYU North Shore, you know, and continue on my, obviously he's, if he's going to college, he's not going to be a pro. But all's to say, they have everything there. What's going wrong, Mormons? What, um... What does it look like in the snowboard world? Because there's obviously a huge concentration in Utah. And yeah, there's I think there's great mountains in Utah. I think there's more. I think okay. there is more Mons in snowboarding. Got it. Yeah, yep. that makes sense. Yep. Interesting. Okay. True grit, I suppose. True grit. Shocking. And okay. needing answers. Article number two, quote, Samsung announces World Surf League partnership citing surfing's open mindset to try new things. This was an and epic, epic letter. Uh, it's worth reading uh, the press release, I mean, of so Samsung. And remember, it brought me back down memory lane. Uh, very enjoyable. Remember when it was nine years ago? It was right. Oh, I'm sorry. It was 2016. It was like right after the World Surf League became the World Surf League. And they announced this Samsung partnership. And remember, I had forgotten about it, but Gabriel Medina's talking board where Charlie could send him text messages on his surfboard yeah that's uh, right that's Gabriel right Cabrini. yeah <laughs> so goofy so funny but that was way back when samsung is back ladies and gentlemen they are sponsoring the world surf league uh street league skateboarding and the professional break dancing league heading wow. into the uh, summer olympics so got it but but yeah the uh press release was written by uh, i think a korean marketing director but so funny about i just i mean i love non-native english all kinds of it but this one was like pure korean non-native english of open mind brings us happy joy kind of <laughs> like literally written in the press release <laughs> and not edited by somebody nope who's it, native just, it was so happy joy but also wondering I, I don't know what the uh yeah what they're actually you know if they're going to be a headlining sponsor or what their it didn't get into specifics of how their sponsorship looks but just two years ago uh the big chest pounding look what we got of the world surf league was apple and you still see these surfers wearing their apple watches in during heats like with their very clear apple watch bands and whatnot and so i mean are those getting swapped out for samsung watches is there did apple just i mean World Surf League, as it does, buries like any sort of negativity or any never responds to anything. It's not like, okay, thanks, Apple. We had a great run and now we're moving, you know, whatever. So mystery, I suppose, there. Yeah, I know. I was wondering, that was my first thought when I saw your article was like, oh, does that mean Apple's no longer involved? You know, even though but Apple hasn't been mentioned for 
right. all year, though they do very clearly show the surfers wearing Apple watches. So yeah. yeah, strange world. I mean, I guess when you have, when you're down to three employees, two of which are Jesse Miley Dyer, uh, it's hard to keep up. Yeah. Well, um, maybe she's all three employees. She's yeah. Jesse, she's Miley, <laughs> and she's Dyer. <laughs> um all right well more as the story develops yep cool well hey let's go to commercial break and then we will be back with barrel or not rocketmoney.com slash surf just this week my wife figured out she was paying a subscription for showtime but then also paying for paramount plus which includes showtime for free that's precisely what rocket money was designed for a modern tool that meticulously tracks the details that we easily get distracted from. It's a finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your monthly spending, and helps you lower your bills. It gives you freedom by helping you see your subscriptions in a simple dashboard and alerts you about hidden fees or increases. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things that you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash surf. Calm the clutter in your head, simplify the tedium of your financial life, and find freedom through rocketmoney.com slash surf. Chaz, back with Barrel and Ah. I like your new podcast setup, David Lee Scales. I got shamed into it. By our various sponsors? No. <laughs> um, by a YouTube commenter. A YouTube commenter said, you look like crap. I mean, yeah. Did you read the comment? <laughs> no, but mine looks like worse crap. I, you're looking at yours makes me think I better start on my podcast studio as well. Well, I looked like crap in two ways, according to the commenter. It was my physical appearance and then um, the lack of things for him to look at behind me on the screen. Great. Yeah, he was well, like, wait, he's wait, like, dude, you... criticism. Yeah. thank you. Well, to be honest, I take all criticism with a grain of salt. I'm like, well, you know, but but sometimes there is truth to it. And yeah, uh, a lot of times. And it, well, so many times, in fact, that our entire show really has been... <laughs> crafted and dictated by listener feedback from day one. Yes. And so it would make my job way harder if I tried to figure it all out on my own. Sometimes listeners point things out. I guess the reality is I never put any effort into the visuals of my studio because I never thought of it as being a visual medium. I've been doing the audio podcast for a decade. We've only been doing the visual version for maybe a year or two. And so I just figured eh, it's designed for audio only. The visual is just a bonus, you know, you can have it or take it or leave it. But now that's developed its own little life and its own little community. And I'm realizing it's obviously a much larger platform. YouTube is a much larger platform than podcasting as, as it exists on Spotify or Apple or anywhere else. And so what are we doing? We should lean into it. We should actually cater to it a little bit, right? Leaning in. I'm, I'm going to match you. I'm going to figure this out myself and get a better thing going here. Yeah. So I put some shelves, put surfboards. Look at this. There's actually a surfboard. Oh, look hanging. at it. Look at that. A Christensen. Yeah. Christensen. One of the best logos, by the way. So by far, I'm going to say, I'm going to not say one of, I'm going to say the best. I'm yeah. going to say Christensen's logo is the best logo in surfing. And we could have different, I mean, we should almost have a whole uh, like bracket war here. We could do like a March Madness of surf logos. Uh, which I feel this has been done maybe before, but we should do it again if it has. I would put the rusty R dot up there. Yeah. I would put uh, Christensen's skull. I would put, I'm going to say one that I dislike. Sorry about it, Matt Biolas, is Lost. I like his mayhem, Tommy Lee Belly, but I don't like the Lost dot 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 Lost and kind of goofy font. Never have, never will. Uh, yeah, on the lightning. Go. The lightning bolt's iconic, but it's not exactly too simple. Yeah, I don't think when I see it, when I see a lightning bolt, or if I see an R dot, I don't think of anything obviously but rusty. When I see a lightning bolt, the first thing that pops into mind isn't lightning bolt surfboards. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Um. By the way, speaking of yellowed boards, that Christensen's pretty yellowed. Yeah. Look at. 
It's looking pretty so. good. Looking pretty. I can see from here even the uh, pressure dings in the deck. Pressure dings, dirty wax job. Nice. Like it. It's a lane splitter. If anybody's interested, I believe Sweet. that's the board model. Uh, anyways, um, so I put some surfboards around took them out of the garage, brought them into the studio just to exist for the cameras, and then uh, included some sponsor stuff, which AG1, drinkag1.com slash surf. We got just, view. Justin J's Hawaii 1K up there, a phenomenal book that I would imagine is still available online. Yep. Got to love that. It is a great book. The most recent issue of Surfing World, issue number 422. If you want an issue in the United States, I will sell it to you on surfsplendorpodcast.com. They send a batch to me to distribute to our U.S. listeners. Uh, and then, of course, a big batch of surf VHS videos from my youth that I had nothing else to do with other than put on display. I've been reading the titles on the shelves, I mean, on the spines, as you've been talking today. You can see it that well? Yep. Okay. I like, I got spit. I got, uh, maybe that's the only one I can see. A uh, couple of Volcom, Magnaplasm, computer yeah. body. Got it. Um, some, uh, what, what um, uh, Josh Palmer films. Ooh, Bliss. Well done. Well done. And TK2, The Kill 2. Well done. In The Kill 4. And then Lost Across America, The Decline. Uh, Larry Haynes, actual rest in peace, Larry Haynes, Kauai boys on the edge right here with Titus Beautiful. and a bunch of other Kauai boys. So that's a classic. Beautiful. All right. Well, hey, uh, barrel or nah? Oh, you know what? This is a listener call. So let's just go ahead and let the listener deliver let's listen. it to you. Chaz, David. Uh, James calling in, got a barrel or not for you. And that is running to the water because the waves are pumping. Or maybe if you're in a tropical location with boat, is it scrambling off the boat? Just scrambling to get out there and catch some tasty tubes, barrel or not. Cheers. Pretty simple. No barrel, David Lee Scales. The only barrel is if it's functional, if the sand is too hot and you have to gingerly quickly run all the way to the water's edge because your feetsies are burning acceptable otherwise i'm going to hold the old line here you can't ever look surfing you can't ever look excited about anything you got to be like oh, it's okay about everything i'm going to maintain let's not give in to the giddiness of youth you just act act like you're way cooler than everything always I'm going to agree with you, but for a different reason. Um, this isn't just to play it cool, but it's to temper expectation. I've seen the waves pumping and I've run to the water. And ultimately I get out there and it's like the tide shifts or the wind shifts. or whatever. It's just not as good as what I saw and what I envisioned myself doing. And so maintaining low expectations usually yields more fun. You over deliver on the fun if you just keep your expectations low completely true no so, barrel running so there is a practicality here though which is getting your heart rate up like a little warm-up of running to get your heart rate up so that when you hit the water you're kind of more conditioned to take advantage of that wave when it comes to you slowly jog <laughs> if you need that heart rate it's a slightly climb jumping jacks by your car yep before you walk slowly to the beach yep uh okay we're going no barrel and running to the water Number two coming in, I think we've done before, a version of it we've done before, but um, there's also a version in here that I think that would be new to us. So. David Lee, Chaz, Animal Chin calling in from San Clemente with a barrel or not. Driving back from Trestles this morning, I saw a RAV4 with just married and then two Venmo and Cash App animals. And then further down, the road i saw one that said turning 21 buy me my first legal drink with a venmo uh i personally think this is a no barrel if you're not invited to the birthday party or the wedding why the hell are you asking me to contribute i don't know you but curious barrel or not venmo begging for birthdays and weddings keep yeah i think the specific which i don't think we've talked about 
because of course we've talked about Venmo, et cetera, et cetera. But the the random uh, begging in this case is absolutely no barrel. It's I think we have talked about it specifically in this case we, too. We t- I think somebody we might have discussed it as it relates to wedding. I think there yeah. was a wedding one before, but I've never seen the birthday i'm turning 21 buy me my first drink i mean it truly makes me want to throw a bottle at that 21 year old's head and say here's your first drink and chuck a glass bottle as hard as i can at that person's head and then yell get a clue afterwards of you know like that giddy like oh what's the what do i have to lose right of somebody might be dumb enough to pay me money like screw you kid that's not cool it's not worth your dignity. Like the no, amount of precisely. money that you will earn off of, you know, you're right. What is there to lose? You know, maybe somebody will throw me 20 bucks. It's your free dignity. 20 bucks. Your dignity costs more than 20 bucks, dude, or do that. And, and it's like, lost. Gone forever. You can never yeah. get it back. No, gone. People selling their dignity for a drink. Disgraceful. Very disgraceful. No barrel ever. Don't ask for Venmo ever unless you have a specific need like I'm all, you know, it's a shame that in this America for our American listeners, uh, that the health insurance and the hospitals, it's so broken here that people have to, right? Like I do not oh, yeah. begrudge anyone who turns to Venmo or, or to whatever. Go fund me. Go fund me for this kind of thing uh, is a shame. And yes, but anything else, any kind of giddy begging is undignified. You said it exactly. Completely. I mean, it actually, in the earlier conversation about like somebody claiming to have autism who hasn't actually been diagnosed with autism is a disservice to those who actually have autism. This is the same thing. Like, yeah, by you doing this on the freeway, asking for a free drink, you are now staining asking for money for the people who actually need it to cover a medical bill or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, so stay out of this water. You and your dumb joke. It's not exactly. funny and all of it. Go, yeah, drive off a cliff, teenagers. I'm going to send them a Venmo request if I ever <laughs> see <laughs> You owe me $20 just for insulting me with your So hedulance. true. Uh, okay, final barrel and ah. So we're both going no barrels on the first two. Final barrel and ah. Chaz, your advice almost always starts as crass then bleeds into comedic regarding people stationed on people movers last week, quote, it's bump time, end quote. (laughs) And by the end, you've somehow delivered a perfectly precise and logical way to handle some of life's most subtle yet annoying and universal encounters. So what do we do about soft talkers? Barrel or not, ask them to repeatedly say again, or barrel or not, do we just exit the conversation? Do work. Great, great, great one. No one annoys like a soft talker. And there's multiple. We could talk. We could spend a whole episode on soft talking. David Lee Scales. Uh, the soft talker is often. So there's a couple soft talkers, right? There's a soft talker who is shy, which I think that's a lot less of the person who's shy, and so they're just oh, you know, soft talking. If you identify a uh, talker as shy then I think you you give grace, right? This person is just doing the best they can. Grace. Most soft talkers are cocky, arrogant jerks. And they're soft talking because they are, that's how they're being dominant, right? They are making you lean in. They're making you really put effort into hearing what they're saying. Uh, and so it is a form of, you know, gorilla in the jungle. I'm number one right here. To those soft talkers, the best thing to do is exactly, and I've learned this from the best, Matt Biolis will mid-sentence of, even if you're talking normal, and this is Matt Biolis being king in the jungle, bro, but uh, he'll say, what? What? Really, really, really loud and obnoxiously right in the middle of a sentence. And I will be talking to Matt Biolis at a perfectly fine volume. What? Uh, what? So I think that's what you do. I think he does it best where you just obnoxiously yell what over soft talker. 
that feels very on brand for Matt Biola. Yeah. <laughs> Gruff is the easiest way to describe his personality. Um, he's probably got bad hearing, right? From planers. I guarantee he has bad hearing, but uh, what we, even if you have good hearing, I think what we take from him, because again, what these soft talk are doing is being arrogant and being uh, what? Like trying to be I dominant. I think there's a version of that, like you said, but I think the other one is also a lack of awareness, you know, just like, and maybe that's narcissism, just like I do things my way. I have zero understanding. I have zero awareness of how anybody else is interpreting me. Yeah. And I it doesn't care. matter. It, I mean, that's what, that's, it's like this dominant, I am the dominant one here. You bend to me. I'm right. going to talk soft and make you lean in and really strain to hear what I'm saying. No. Matt Biolis, that person, shout what in the middle? Is there a less gruff version of just simply saying, I cannot hear you. I'm sorry that I've asked you three times to repeat, but you speak very low volume. Maybe I'm bad at, maybe I have poor hearing. Can you please raise the volume of your voice? No, because they want, that's what they want. They want as dominant here. They want you to then come supplicating at their feet, asking for gifts and favors of them at which point they will still just soft talk they'll be like yeah. oh man so sorry and they'll talk they, a little bit louder for a minute and then go right back down to the soft talk. yeah it's interesting of all the years i've encountered soft talkers i nor have i ever heard anybody else address it directly yeah just be like hey can you raise your voice a little bit other than yeah. i guess your map by Ellis example but i've my only recourse has been politely excuse myself from the conversation I'm telling you the the third way shown to us by one of the world's leading shapers is to scream what? Okay, <laughs> will do. All right, next cocktail party I'm at. Yeah, what? You're gonna hear me screaming. You do it real loud and like, I mean, Matt's what is like? It's the same as like I want to fight you. What? It's like so aggressive. You're right though. In the King of the Jungle metaphor that you're painting. The soft talker is demanding you to come down to their level. Yes. He is now demanding you come up to his level in such an offensive way that you are going to politely excuse yourself from the situation. Precisely. Precisely. You know, like I like I said I would do to the soft talker. Now he's thrown the gauntlet and that person, the soft talker is going to be like, fuck, I don't even want to tell you what I was going to say anyways, because you're so obnoxious. I'm just going to walk away backwards. Win, win. In win, win. Case. Yeah, totally. Man, I don't know why this had to become confrontational, but it seems to be the right answer. It, it completely like it, you just got to dominate there. You, it's there's very few times where I'm like, okay, come on, this is a you know all of that art of war, all this bull crap, whatever, leave it. Except for this, except for when it comes to the soft talker, just roll over him with what? And ten out of ten times when I've been in that situation, I did not care at all no. about what the person was saying. I was strictly being polite. It's not like soft talker was a like financial wizard who was giving you a secret of investment that you could then take and make millions of dollars if you just strained your hearing. If you just invest in Mormon right now. Yes. <laughs> um, so that's a hundred percent true. Soft talker is never somebody who's interesting. No. Soft talker or, is just or insightful. Being... No, soft talker is just arrogantly soft talking just to get people to strain. Soft talker is boring and un, you know, uh, uninsightful, doesn't have anything important to say. So what are we doing here anyways? Yelling what at the soft talker? Exactly. That's the only way to handle it. Once again, we land on an absolute truth to end yep. the show. Thanks, Matt Biolis. It takes 90 minutes to get here oftentimes, but here we are. We do it. All right. Well, hey, thank you. Drinkag1.com slash surf and um, beachgrid.com for everything at surf journalist doing the the black magic. So, I mean, man, babies and surf careers. I just like it's tiring, but it truly does bring me joy to watch Kelly win a heat, to know that he's fathering a boy and to watch Michael Dunphy come on tour to get booted off in an embarrassing disgusting 20, manner 2025 storyline you heard it here first i got and i did, let's not forget the spite tree that i planted in philippe toledo's heart that hopefully will flower at chopu
blossom and bloom. Um, I have seen enough movies to see like when a witch or warlock casts a major spell, it does take a lot out of them. They usually like collapse yeah. in exhaustion after the fact. So you might need a nap. I do. I do today. Okay. Rest up, man. Drink your ag1.com slash surf. Will do. All right. Until next week. Keep work. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. See you next week. Bye-bye.